So first I want to acknowledge all my folks that have worked on that with us. A um, bunch of them are here, postdocs, collaborators. This is a 15 year effort for now and it's going on to be another 25 years for that study. So it's a very, very long study with uncountable sets of undergraduate students and a lot of logistics. And I start with um, this video, which you can see here, which is a, a video of our bay we work in on Antarctica breaking off. And um, the video is, I take it because A is beautiful, B, we have been on that sea ice four hours before it broke off. So it's still real to work down there and you um, gotta be careful. And that's the place where emperor penguins live. So uh, their environment and their habitat is in a sense in peril. But now uh, we wanna start with Mac. Um, I'm a physicist originally. And at some point I got interested in penguins because I was doing biomedical stuff before, uh, got bored and uh, started to overwinter, stay for a whole year in Antarctica. And there was suddenly a, a penguin colony, which I found more interesting than whatever I have been doing before. So I stick with that. And uh, the one thing theme that is always going to come back today is uh, huddling. So huddlings, emperor penguins being very close together. And those penguins, um, why do they do that? They do that because they breed in winter. It's the only uh, vertebrate that breeds in winter. And the males have to fast for about 110 days. It gets really cold, really windy. And so they form these very, very dense clusters of penguins. And of course, from a physicist perspective, we, you know, I was working on colloids before. So we thought, uh, I thought myself reminded of colloids. And of course, there's major differences. Well, colloids are more dynamically driven than in equilibrium. Penguins are all self-driven, very far away from equilibrium. Uh, nonetheless, they share a bunch of properties in terms of order, rotation, criticality scale-free velocity correlations, and especially jamming. Penguins have a way to get out of jamming quite a bit. Um, what are we going to do to talk about today? As I said, this started about 15 years ago, and initially I had a lot of biophysical basic science research questions. Mostly today will be about the collective behavior on very different timescales for emperor penguins. And uh, we, when, since we kept doing this uh, and kept running this program, we tack more and more ecological questions on and kind of using the effects we can describe with physics to understand about the ecology and how well penguins are doing. So our second topic of today will be remote sensing of emperor penguin and ecosystem health using what we learned in the first part of the talk. All right, where do we work? We work in Atka Bay, uh, here top right. It's on the other side of South Africa in Antarctica. Atka Bay is uh, about 30, 25 to 30 kilometer wide bay. And um, we have an observatory there, which is basically a container. That observatory sits on one of these ice fingers you can see here. And this is very important because this is our main instrument. So um, these ice fingers, this is glacier, uh, about 300 meters thick. And then here you see the penguin colony spread apart a little. They are sitting on frozen ocean, which is frozen onto this uh, glacier, which we call land fast sea ice. It's about between one and three meters thick. And we have our little container there that has a lot of cameras on top, uh, high resolution, thermal overview, which allows us to, con to continuously look at the penguin colony, see what they are doing, where are they day and night. It allows us to take panoramic images, a couple of gigapixel large, which allows us to zoom in and kind of zoom in very far to see what are the individuals doing and how does individual motion actually affect collective behavior. And I give you this for 30 seconds. So once we started to record, we saw um, basically change. And my question I had here, very basic, can we actually describe, can we parameterize how, why does the colony look the way it looks? You see it changes shape, it changes density, changes location. So if you think about that, um, today's topic is how can we parameterize a penguin colony and then how can this help us assess climate change impacts. So if you think about parameters, we kind of need three. Three is the basic minimum I found, I found we would need to describe it. One is location. Where are they moving and why are they moving somewhere? The other one is density. How dense is the colony at any given time and moment in time? And the third one is when they are in these very dense packed huddles, what are the rules that govern huddling, if they huddle, stay together, it, it breaks apart. Motion is pretty simple. You can see a video here. I'll let it run for a little. So you can see that the penguins move to the right. Then they're here on the right. And then they collectively start and 
move back to the left. And everything goes kind of slow. Why is that? It's rather, it's easy. They follow the wind. So we find that if we look at it and we get the, the wind direction, penguins basically uh, move downwind and they do that for flow and high wind speeds. And you can explain this by a treadmilling effect. If you look at this big group over here, the wind is coming from where my cursor is right now, right to the spot and the penguins on the left are getting cold. They move to the left. The penguins on the right are getting cold. They move to the right. And uh, with a long time, over a long time, basically the whole thing moves backwards like a treadmill, which then also makes penguins uh, get to the warm center and get then back into the cold and back to the warm center. So that's rather easy to explain. So we got location down. Next one, uh, density. Density. Um, we can kind of define, you know, huddling phase states. So we can define when penguins are very scattered, it's kind of a gaseous state that there is very little impact and each individual can move freely. Uh, we, we can define them as loosely clustered when they are not impeded by others in their motion. So they can still move, but they cannot move freely everywhere because penguins are so close that they might bump into each other. And then they can be really densely clustered in a sense in a solid. And if you look at this video, let it run for a little. This is about 25 minutes or so, oh, a bit longer, like three hours. Suddenly, they came very close together. And I let it run one more time for you to see it in detail. So here you go. Penguins are all spread apart. It's about uh, midnight. And then they cluster. And so they change, they change their face. Why is that? You would think, you know, there should be one... One environmental parameter you can find that works very well and can make them uh, all come together. And yes, if we look at it, wonderful dew point, you see the dew point here on the right. As soon as the dew point increases to over minus 21 point something, in this case, the size of the colony dramatically shrinks. So the density increases. And you see this little increase before the decreasing part, which is basically when they all start to move. So they are kind of in a steady state, steady state, steady state. Then the dew point changes, uh, reaches the critical value. Uh, penguins start to move a lot. It, this is apparently a larger colony size and then it starts to drop. Wonderful, we thought that's it. We got it, we solved it. You tried on the next example, doesn't work anymore. So, but what works is to come up with a uh, um, apparent or perceived penguin temperature. And so to describe the phase transition between huddling and not huddling, we right now use an apparent temperature or a perceived temperature, whatever a penguin would feel. You can think of it as the wind chill temperature for humans. And uh, that we describe as a linear combination. And I know it's very wrong to use a linear combination for that. Sadly, it still works best. Um, <laughs> a linear combination of temperature, the wind speed, the radiation and humidity. And each of those factors get a weighing factor, which we give it, uh, put it in the unit of degrees Celsius per meters per second. And that would mean in this case that uh, if the wind speed increases by one meter per second, the perceived temperature decreases by minus 2.8 degrees Celsius. All right. And we can come up with this apparent temperature and we can use a normal sigmoid, which you can see here on the right, to basically fit the phase transition um, from not from being huddled down here when they are huddled, to when they are being scattered, all right? Um, and the temperature at the x-axis is a perceived temperature. It's not uh, the temperature we actually measure. Okay, allows us to describe that. Please keep that in mind. It will be important later on when we go more into details here. Now, the huddling structure, uh, that's a very interesting one. So um, they build these massive huddles and you can see here on the top left, inside the huddle, it can be about 30 degrees Celsius warm, like 90 uh, Fahrenheit, when outside is at minus 40. So it's really, 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 really very efficient. And it's key to their survival. That species only survives down there because they uh, develop that, uh, that huddling behavior. And it makes them the only non-territorial penguins. So all other penguins, when they are breeding, they fight a lot and they always fight for their space. Emperor penguins do not. They are a very example of a classic selfish herd. Uh, they act selfishly, but it, in the end, it benefits all of them. Um, and if you look at the dynamics, uh, started as a video first. So there's a video on the left. You see that dude here is walking. 
but you don't see much action actually going in in the huddle. While if you fast forward it, so everything is really, really slow, you see that there's actually a lot of action going on. And so there's a rotating huddle here on the right. And at some point the huddle breaks off. You can see all the steam coming out, which is because it's so warm inside, breaks off, steam comes out, and then uh, it comes to a, to a standstill again. And uh, how do they do that? How do they manage to move in that huddle is, they employ a wave for a Mexican wave as you do in the stadium. So if you look here at the bottom left, I replay it as, as the whole thing is now stand, standing still. And then some penguin starts to move and that motion uh, kind of propagates throughout the whole huddle until everybody completed one tiny little step and keeps on going. And if we look on a large scale on that, you see that that helps them to change the huddle, change the location, change the shape. So they actually, key part here is they stay mobile while being in that dense uh, cluster. And basically that's how they overcome jamming. They would be too jammed to move all together or individually, but because they uh, have this uh, wave that propagates through the group, they stay mobile. All right, we can look at this into detail. You see penguin standing, 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 making a step, standing, 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 making a step. And that step propagates down the x-axis, uh, the y-axis here, with a wave speed of about 12 centimeters per second. We published this like in, in a decade ago. Um, all right, so how can we model this? We can model this as a traffic jam, all right? Uh, but a traffic jam that actually goes in two directions, because in a traffic jam, a car can only pull. So once this car starts to move, there is a, the space gets bigger, and then the second car starts to accelerate. And this acceleration phase, because it's not instantaneous speed, makes the whole thing uh, do this um, caterpillar-like motion. And for penguins, we can kind of do the same. We can model that step wave as um, a traffic jam, but penguins can actually pull in the front. So if a penguin starts to move away, um, then there is a gap, and the penguins in the rear tries to close that gap, moves as well, and that triggers the wave. Same, uh, as, same is true from the penguins in the back. They start to move, they bump into a penguin, then that penguin in front of them starts to move. So those traveling waves always travel in both directions, front and back. Key part here is that the threshold for them to start to move is about two centimeters. And that threshold is the same as the thickness of the plumage of the feathers. So what actually happens is a penguin wants to move, starts to move into the front, compresses the feather of the guy in front of them, that guy gets cold by that, starts to move as well. Um, and what does that help them? Ultimately, this leads to optimal packing. So because they keep doing this over and over and over, all imperfections in their model, in their uh, huddle, basically get um, healed over time. And we modeled this with the same uh, traffic jam model. And basically, even if you start with a quarter uh, position standard deviation here on the bottom right, you end up in an, in the steady state just after two time steps. So it goes really, really fast that the whole thing realigns again, and uh, th that leads to maximum energy savings. All right, what else do we see? We see rotation. You see this huddle is rotating here. Um, and there's another example of them rotating here. Why are they rotating? Um, they are rotating. They get an attractive system. So um, an attractive system means they want to be together because they want the warmth, but they have to move. And I didn't get into this yet. Now, why do they have to move? Because they all are carrying an egg on their feet. And if we would be in one room, I would make it, I would show it to you in person, but they are having one egg on their feet, balancing it on the feet, and they have to rotate this egg. But if they are packed with a person in front, a penguin in front of them on their back, they can't reach the egg with a beak. So our theory is that they try to lift the egg with one foot and make it rotate a little. And by rotating a little, um, it will, uh, they kind of bump into the person in front of them because they make this little step. So that means movement is necessary to keep the egg rotated. And the only way you can keep moving while you're uh, in an attractive system is where the whole huddle starts to rotate. So rotation is critical. Um, sometimes, there is no symmetry break. So here you see the huddle can't decide in which direction to rotate. It comes on and goes back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, but ultimately does not start and uh, rotate in one direction. Okay, so that's the concluding the science, uh, the physics part. 
um, we can describe the colony state by an apparent temperature in first order. We would need a more short-term history to describe the short-term variability because right now we do not account that if a huddle just broke off, it takes some time for them to come back together. And the colony locomotion is mainly driven by wind with exploration phases we have not looked into yet. Um, the coordinated motion allows maximum density. It allows motion in the dense packing and it allows merging of huddles. I could have no time to show into this. The open question is the trigger for the motion. I just told you, I believe it's that they have to rotate the egg. And to study this, we actually built fake eggs at some point that had an accelerometer and six thermometers in there, but the electronics did not survive the minus 50. And so that experiment failed. But at least the penguins adopted that and we should do it again, but we did not get around to it. All right, why did we not get around to it? Because um, life brought us to do more ecology. And so how can we use what we learned here to actually help us assess with climate change impacts? And um, all of the, our Southern Ocean people, and most of you will know that, um, of course, we are warming up and the Southern Ocean is under threat. The Southern Ocean is still kind of pristine, but we expect massive temperature changes and we expect massive sea ice degradation. And so we expect a lot of change to the uh, ecosystems, all right? And uh, the emperor penguin lives on the sea ice. And because this lives on the sea ice, it is projected to be quasi extinct by the end of the century. All right, depending on which, uh, uh, which uh, Paris Agreement model or projection we take, the emperor penguin population might be decimated between 50% and 90%. Keep in mind, that's a model. And we are here to make sure that we can actually measure if that model is correct or not. Let's hope it's not. Um, and the emperor penguin lives in about 61 colonies all around Antarctica. And it's a central place forager. So animals go, jump in the ocean, feed, come back, feed their chick, go, jump in the ocean, feed, come back, feed their chick. They do this all over. They sometimes switch colonies, not much, but genetically seen the whole 61 colonies is basically one. And um, so why is it so hard now to measure it? How can we use what we learned to improve conservation? And the numbers, you know, just assessing how many emperor penguins are around right now is super difficult and has approximately, I would say, an error of 50%. This is because we are doing it from satellite imagery mostly. And satellite imagery is what you get here on the right. So uh, this is, uh, again, down here is frozen ocean uh, and the ice shelf and the penguins. Uh, you see on the uh, in picture A, you see all the guano stains. And in picture B, you see an inset and this bunch here. The two darker patches are emperor penguin patches. And the task now is to calculate how many emperor penguins are this from uh, that one image that you get per year. And um, so the, and the second problem is we never know how many of the penguins are actually at the colony, all right? Because they are central place foragers, they keep feeding their chicks. So um, their, their phenology is as follows in summer, also, summer, there is no penguins around from January till April. And then by April, they most of them arrive. There is the mating season. And then by, uh, females lay an egg, give the egg to the male. Females leave. And then between June and August, you have this time when there is almost no females at the colony. So about half, all the breeding population, half of it is there. And then the females return. Uh, so you have this little bump. And after that, you have them going and get food independently. So you have a constant reduction of uh, emperor penguins. Now, ideally, you would measure how many uh, do live at one colony in July, because you know there's only half the breeding population, only males are there. So July is the ideal time to measure. Unfortunately, between May and September, it's too dark to get a picture. All right. So because there's no satellite, uh, there's, it's uh, Austral winter, satellites can't take a picture. It's way too dark for that. Um, and then the second problem is in which state is the colony. So if you look up here, um, you would not know how huddled they are. And how huddled they are will really have an impact on how many animals you estimate to be there from the area that you get. And how can we help with that? So number A, we can measure how many penguins are around. So this is a panoramic image we took from our spot observatory. And it actually allows us to count individual animals. And by counting individual animals, we can study the phenology. We know the uncertainty of the phenology. We know how many are 
there between September and October, and what is the how much does that number fluctuate? And we can see this for two different colonies we work at. So that at least helps us to as address the occupancy, how many penguins are in the area right now at the, any given time. Um, our phase transition helps to actually um, uh, calculate come from from area or density to numbers. And you can see one example here, which we are just publishing on the right, where we have an image taken with our camera systems, and we reduce that image to the resolution of a, a satellite image that you can currently get. And then you get this kind of this top view here. And with that top view and the environmental conditions we get from reprocessed uh, forecasting data, so it's not locally measured, it's reprocessed forecasting data, we can predict how many penguins would that be. And you see the comparison between prediction in red and measured in blue. So measured is we have people on the ground, they count every single penguin in photographs, and then they do this every week. And then we use our data to try to see how well does our model actually help us to get there. And um, we still have sometimes trouble. So when, the, when it's really, 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 really dense, uh, the models don't work perfectly, but for most of the year, uh, the red line, the, the red dot coincides very well with the blue line. And so we can use uh, our phase transition model to actually improve the counts that are done by satellite imagery. All right, last one. Um, okay, so where, where else can this help us? Um, one of the very important things that we try to do is understand how is the, you know, how is the ocean ecosystem changing? And this is usually done by biologging. So you take a penguin and you put a logger on the penguin and you see where the penguin swims and then you see how long the penguin stays away and you can learn something from that. And we do that all the time, but it's super tedious. It takes about me about four hours to tag a penguin and it's kind of invasive. And we want to reduce that invasiveness so we could estimate how well is the, the penguin colony doing in different states in or around Antarctica in different locations. And I have one, one uh, movie here. This is a week of data. And you can see how the density and the location is fluctuating. All right. Comes together. And then they are moving all east because it's dense. And then it spreads out again. Spreads out, spreads out, spreads out. And comes together. All right. So. And we learned we can describe the apparent temperature the penguins are feeling with our um, with our linear approximation. And now, how can we use that? What is the phase transition application here? Keep in mind, we have our apparent temperature on the x-axis, and we have our density. We change the density on the y-axis. And you can see that um, we have a phase transition from being fully huddled to being scattered. And at the 50-50 point, we can define that this is our critical temperature, right? We can't even find it anywhere, but let's define it here. Um, what would we expect? If a penguin is very well nourished, so they are all pretty fat and they have a lot of energy reserves, then we would expect that our transition point moves to colder temperatures because the guys get colder later, later meaning at colder temperatures. In turn, if they are very skinny, we can actually move that. Uh, we expect that the transition temperature will be higher than before. So the phase transition will be shifted to the right. OK, what does that help us? If we track the transition temperature within a year and we have a very cold year where penguins are uh, lose energy a lot very soon, then the transition temperature will be increasing very, very fast. So the slope here will be higher. If it's too high, we will abort. Um, they will abort their breeding cycle and always save their life and try again next year. So we can kind of track within a year why, um, how well are they doing. And why can we do this? Because they all arrive with maximum fat reserves in April. And from April to August, there is no new energy intake. So this is within one year. More interesting is actually if we do this across years. So if we track the transition temperature across years, we can learn something about foraging. We can learn something about how much food was still in the ocean. Because if there is, they still find enough food, that means they come back with the same fat reserves. That means that the transition temperature should be stable in April when they always arrive. Though if their food, if they find less food, 
there's two things that can happen. Either the transition temperature is increasing or the timing when they arrive is later because they need more time to build up the fat reserves. Uh, both would be dramatic because if they come later, then they need the same time to breed. The sea ice might already be broken up once they are uh, done with breeding and then all the chicks get swept away, which actually happened twice so far. So we have two documented uh, full generation losses due to El Nino in 16 and 17. And so with that, by using the transition temperature tracking, as well as knowing where the penguins swim, I told you we still tag them, we can actually, uh, we can achieve remote sensing of colony health, foraging success, and food supply. And I have one last result for you, that in the years 2012 to 2015, the critical temperature or transition temperature did not change. So this is all April data and it's still stable for now. So that's good. Um, we haven't analyzed newer data since then, uh, working on that. But uh, what we are doing right now, I would say, is we are kind of collecting a baseline, trying to understand what is what are we now and trying to see how is the ecosystem changing by merely taking pictures of penguins and not weighing uh, 10,000 of them. So in a sense, we achieved that we can weigh 10,000 penguins at the same time by applying what we learned before from our phase transition part. Good. That is it. Thank you very much. I'm at 26 minutes, so I, I, I hope we have enough time to chat. And I'm open for questions and have a nice video for you.